On our desert island this week is the celebrated pianist Moira Limpany, who has recently celebrated the 50th anniversary of her first public performance. Now, Limpany is a most attractive name. Where does it originate? It's my mother's maiden name, but in the old spelling. I was actually born Johnston, Moira Johnston, and though on my birth certificate was put Mary Johnston, uh, I was called Moira from birth. It's a diminutive of Mary uh, in Russian. And uh, then when I was 12 and I was about to give my first concert, Basil Cameron said to Mummy, what's her name? And she said, Moira Johnston. He said, well, he said, Moira's lovely, but Johnston doesn't go with it and it, does, it won't look good on the posters. And so he said to Mummy, what's your name? And she said, Limpany, uh, the L-I-M-P-E-N-N-Y. And uh, he said, well, that's a bit better. And she said, then what about the old spelling, L-Y-M-P-A-N-Y? And he said, that's beautiful. And that's how I became Limpany within a few seconds and remained it all my life. Was your mother a musical lady? She was very musical. She played the piano and she also played the cello. And uh, she said that she got her love of music and her understanding when she was in Russia. She went to Russia before she was married. And like you, she was a very good linguist. She was a very good linguist. In fact, she spoke very many more languages than I do. She spoke seven. I speak about three or four. Now, you went off to boarding school abroad very early indeed. Yes. Um, you see, we were very poor, and my father uh, had been an army officer, and uh, he had never really been trained to do a job. And my mother had to try and keep, keep us all going. There were three of us. I had two brothers. One was killed in the war. And uh, therefore, she sent me uh, to... Belgium, having seen an, an advertisement in the Catholic Times which said uh, convent in Belgium, a uh, five pounds a term. Five pounds a term? Well, don't forget after the war, that was uh, in the 1920s, I suppose, the, the pound was worth a lot of Belgian francs. Yes, but I've been doing some quick calculations. That works out at about eight shillings a week. Were you adequately fed? They all eat very well in That's Belgium. That's what I thought. And I not only ate very well, but the nuns were just divine to me. And there was um, an older man there, Monsieur Jaminet, who was about 75 or so, who used to come and give lessons in dramatics, you know, plays and, you know, choral things. And he was, he was a poet, he was everything. And uh, he began to realise very soon that I had this talent. And so the nuns allowed me to practise sometimes as much as five hours a day. Even when the other girls were playing netball or hockey or whatever they do in Belgian yes. convents, you didn't mind? You, you were quite no, happy I with your I practice? Just, no, Play, play, play. I was at the piano all day long. <laughs> <laughs> now, you made your debut at 12 years old. How did that come about? Well, my mother and I were living at that time in either Bexhill or um, St. Leonard's on Sea. And Mummy took me to a concert at White Rock Pavilion, Hastings. Basil Cameron was conducting, and there was a boy prodigy playing. And I listened to the concert. And when it was over, I said to Mummy, Mummy, couldn't I play? And she said, well, I'll, I'll ask Mr Cameron. So she wrote Mr Cameron, and um, he said he'd give me an audition. And I played to him, and he said, yes, I'll engage her. And uh, he said, the concerts are already fully booked in Hastings for the season, but I'm going to do the summer season in Harrogate. Would you like her to play there? So I said, yes. And so I was booked for the 8th of August... In, in Harrogate, and that's how I gave my, my first concert. And I played the Mendelssohn G minor concerto because it was the only thing that I'd ever learnt that I could play with orchestra. And that is indeed your first record, the first record you've chosen for your Desert Island, your own recording. Yes, of the because it has just been reissued for my 50th anniversary.
the opening of the Mendelssohn Piano Concerto No. 1 in G minor, recorded with the Philharmonia Orchestra conducted by Raphael Kubelik. What was your plan in choosing these eight records for your desert island? Well, when I started, I chose a number of records which I love very much, and then I realised that they were practically identical to the ones that I had chosen when I believe I came to you 22 years ago and did Desert Island. Yes, indeed. And I thought, this is really going too far to have practically the same records again. And then I thought, well, since I'd be on an island, on presumably on my own, I would be looking back on my life. I would reminisce about the 50 years of concert giving that I had and I thought wouldn't it be nice to reminisce with my own records instead. You've chosen a program of your of own my recordings. own recordings, yes. Well, where do we go next after the Well Anderson? I thought perhaps uh, we should uh, play the first record I ever made. What was that? Which was uh, the um, the preludes of Rachmaninoff. And that was very interesting because during the war, I think it was like 1940, uh, Decker came and um, asked whether I would do the 24 Rachmaninoff preludes, which had never, ever been recorded, not even by the composer. And I knew exactly two of the 24, but I said yes, as usual. And so I learnt them as I went along. Mm -hmm. And uh, they've been a great success. Which one have you chosen to play? I've chosen the G major one, uh, which is one I often play as an encore. Rachmaninoff Prelude No. 16 in G Major. Now let's go back to your childhood. You made your debut at 12, a very promising youngster, but there was a great deal to do. You won a scholarship, didn't you? I won a scholarship at the age of 13 to the Royal Academy of Music, mm -hmm. and uh, then I stayed there three years. And won a gold medal. Yes, I won uh, the gold medal for the best student of the year. You'd already started broadcasting at this point. Yes, the BBC were very um, kind and, and had me for many recitals. And then eventually, a, a little bit later, I think I was then probably about 15 or 16, Reginald Redman, who was at the Cardiff BBC, he began asking me to uh, record things that were not played very often. And he would say, do you play this? And I would say, yes, and go out and buy the music. <laughs> Where did you study next? And then I went to Vienna for one year. Yes, you kept yourself in Vienna by acting as an au pair, I believe. Well, if you'll, yes, I suppose it was a kind of au pair because uh, my mother had arranged for me to um, go to a convent in which I would talk English and give English lessons to the girls in return for my board and lodging. Mm -hmm. And I studied in Vienna with uh, Paul Weingarten. Yes. I had about nine months with him, enjoyed it very much. Then I came back to England and I got another scholarship at the Royal Academy of Music. But after two terms, my mother, for some reason or other, she was very ambitious for me and perhaps she thought that it was high time to go higher places. She uh, got me to Mathilde Verne, who had taught Solomon. And she was also a pupil of Clara Schumann, the wife of Schumann. And that was a new type of life for me, a new type of lesson completely. In what way? Well, she, she was very, very strict. And um, whereas I really had a very good technique, I could play anything, she said, you must 
practice regularly from now on. And you start, say, at 10 till 11, and then again 12 till 1, and then, say, 3.30 to 4.30, and a cup of tea, and then 5 to 6. You must practice and learn to practice regularly. You still do that? I still do that. I'm very, very disciplined. Now, you gave the obligatory recital at the Wigmore Hall. Yes, that was uh, Mathilde Verne's idea, and that was a great success. There was an international competition, a big international competition, in which you did exceedingly well. That was in Brussels, and uh, that was in 1938. And Matty, by this time I had gone to Matty because dear Mathilde Verne had died. And uh, Matty said to me, you, you must go in for this competition. I said, oh, I didn't stand a chance. There were going to be pianists from all over the world up to the age of 30. I was 21. And anyway, I went in and I was lucky enough to, to be second to Gilles. Oh, well, and, that. Yes, but I uh, would love to tell you about the last week of the competition, which was when the 12 finalists were put into the palace of Larkin, you know, the royal palace of Larkin. Mm -hmm. And uh, the queen was staying there at, the same, at that time, and so was King Leopold. And we were all given a room with a bed and a piano in and we practiced there. But in the evenings, uh, Gilles would play jazz for us, and we would dance. <laughs> and King Leopold came along one morning and said, it seemed to me that I heard strains which weren't very classical last night. <laughs> and uh, a lot came from, from that competition because actually we were put into that chateau to learn a new work. We had seven days to learn a new concerto which was composed for the occasion by Jean Absil, and I played it by heart. And I think that was a tremendous help, yes, should we I'm say, sure. in getting me a second prize, but also it was a tremendous help in getting me the first performance of the Cacciatorian Piano Concerto, because now we come to 1940, there was to be a, a concert at the Queen's Hall, which was, you know, before it was bombed, of new Russian works. And they asked Clifford Curzon uh, whether he would learn the Catch Tone Piano Concerto for the occasion. And there was only a month to learn it in. And he said, well, I have a lot of work. But he said, go to Maura Limpney. She learns very quickly. <laughs> and that had a great deal to do uh, with, we say, my career, because... Um, it was a very, very brilliant work. Then I was asked to record it. Uh, it was the first recording, should we say, outside Russia. And I also gave the first performance in Paris and in Brussels and at the Scala mm -hmm. and in Vienna. Now, that's to be your third record. Which part of it are we going to hear? Oh, I think, I think we'll have the last movement for a change. <laughs> third movement of the Cacciatorian Concerto that you played with the London Philharmonic Orchestra conducted by Anatole Fistulari. Now, Rachmaninoff and then Cacciatorian, you've always had an affinity with Russian music, haven't you? Yes, it's very amusing that I was called uh, a specialist in Russian music. You see, for me, it was just pure chance, like so much of my career anyway. Uh, first, I'd been asked to do the Rachmaninoff Preludes. So that was a success. So I then was asked to do the Rachmaninoff Third Concerto. That was a success. So then I was asked to do the Rachmaninoff Second, and then the First Concerto. 
And then we started on Prokofiev 1 and 3. And in the meanwhile, I think I'd done Kachaturian. So, I mean, these were all Russians. Yeah. But I did a lot of English music, you know. That, of course, is forgotten because uh, English music doesn't get played as often as Russian music. <laughs> We've got some English music next. Would you like to talk about that? Well, I, I chose the Ross Thorne No. 1 concerto for many reasons. First of all, uh, I love the work very much. I think it's a very good work. It was also the work that I was asked to play immediately after the war in many festivals. The British Council asked me to go and play in Paris with Adrian Bolt. We went over... And we gave a concert, two concerts, in fact, in Paris, five weeks after the liberation of Paris. And the British Council asked me to learn the Raw's Thorn for the occasion. And after that, I went to Prague at the first festival after the war, which was in 46. And I played it there. Now, which section of that are we going to hear? I think we'll play the last, the Tarantella. <laughs> The third movement of the first Rothorn Piano Concerto with the Philharmonia Orchestra conducted by Herbert Mingus. Now, the war had held up your development as an international artist, hadn't it? Well, it did, but you see, I think that uh, in another way it gave me tremendous experience here. I played all over the place, naturally, and um, uh, it gave me a big repertoire Mm -hmm. And it gave me the opportunity to play often, which is very, very good. It's, it's experience all the time. You have an exceptionally big repertoire, haven't you? Yes, I now play about 60 concertos. 60, that's And uh, I'm always learning new things. For instance, now I'm doing a lot of Malcolm Williamson mm -hmm. and uh, the Benjamin Britten piano concerto, which I never did before. Yes. So, um, uh, you see, I think it's very good. It keeps me young. What's your fifth record for the Desert Island? Well, I've chosen Mozart. I used to play a great deal of Mozart, and um, I've chosen the C major, and I've chosen the slow movement. <laughs> The slow movement of the Mozart Concerto No. 21, accompanied once again by the Philharmonia Orchestra, conducted by Herbert Mengis. Now, in your career of 50 years since that 12-year-old debut, you've done a vast amount of travelling. Russia, the Far East, South America, North America, all over Europe, United States. You've lived in the United States, of course. Yes, well, I married an American in 51, so yes. I went to live out isn't it a rather lonely life, travelling from place to place, hotel to hotel? Sometimes, I should imagine, a rather terrible hotel. No, sometimes hotels are terrible, but I really like my travelling and my loneliness because it gives me a chance to replenish the 
the batteries. Um, I generally read my music going up, or alternatively, um, a book. And coming back, I would generally do my tapestry. I don't do it going to a concert because uh, I'm frightened of it tightening my hands. And of course, there's the anxiety of planes or trains not being on time. You're always on time, but it's been said that you were late for your wedding. Oh, well, that's a very sweet story. My husband, being American, had flown over at a moment's notice, taken about a week's holiday or something, to come over and marry me. So we got, uh, what you call it, uh, the uh, special license, and we got married in Chelsea Registry Office. And as I happened to be playing at the proms that day, we had arranged it so it suited him for his days, and then I could get off on so-called honeymoon, you see. And... So my friends had arranged for uh, a lovely, beautiful white Rolls Royce to pick me up at 10.20. It was just around the corner from Chelsea Registry. And at 10.25, the car not being there, we rang through and they said, oh, we've got a book for next week. And I said, not next week, it's right now, you know. So he said, I'll be right over. So he was over, but I was late for my wedding. <laughs> and um, anyway, uh, I went to the rehearsal at the proms and I arrived there at 12, and uh, the journalist wrote, pianist late for her wedding, on time for her rehearsal. <laughs> and then as I w went in, the orchestra stood up and played the wedding march. Of course. Right, record number six. Well, I chose the preludes of Chopin, and I chose the number four in E minor. <laughs> Chopin, prelude number four in E minor. Now, apart from tapestry, what are your other interests? Well, I'm, I'm mad about gardening, of course. I gather that in your London house, you've got, in the middle of London, you've got a greenhouse. I managed to get a greenhouse on a flat roof there, and it's really my pride and joy, and uh, I've got a lot of things growing there. They, they haven't brought me any fruit yet, but I've got mangoes and guavas. <laughs> and you have wider agricultural interests in France? I've got a vineyard in France, yes. Splendid. Yes. How big? It's one, one acre. It yes. brings me in about, oh, probably about 1,000, 1,200 bottles a year. And as one who's been privileged to taste it, it's good stuff. <laughs> it's, I think it's very good. But do you know we've had the gold medal in Paris? I mean... <laughs> uh, we've had the proper acclamation for it. Well Another record. I chose this time the Schubert Trout Quintet because I love it very much and it's really a pity that I haven't played more chamber music. I did when I was at the Royal Academy of Music but even now, you know, my day is taken up with learning new works. And therefore, you can't be giving your days to playing chamber music with your, with your colleagues. So that's why, unfortunately, I haven't done so much chamber music. So here we have my uh, Schubert Trout. <laughs>
the opening of Schubert's Trout Quintet with principals of the London Symphony Orchestra. Now, as a castaway, obviously you wouldn't starve. You can cultivate. Well, I would hope that I could have got away with a few seeds in my pocket, <laughs> and that would have started me on my gardening there. How good a carpenter are you? Could you put up a shelter? Not in the slightest. No. Good at fishing? Yes, I probably could f find a piece of string and a cork or something and fish. That's the only way I know how to fish, though I adore it. <laughs> <laughs> Would you try to escape? Well, I don't know how I could escape because I'm not a good swimmer. So how could I escape? I'd have to wait for a boat to come and fetch me, wouldn't I? We'll try and organise that. Your last record. My last record, I chose the Rachmaninoff Third Concerto. It was one of the first I ever did, and uh, it's always been one of my very, very favorites. <laughs> Rachmaninoff Third Piano Concerto with the New Symphony Orchestra of London, conducted by Anthony Collins. Now, if you could take just one disc of the eight of yours which you played us, which would it be? Well, I would take the Mendelssohn. And you're allowed to take one luxury to your island. What have you chosen? Well, I'd like to take my wine, but then I wouldn't call it a luxury. I would call it a necessity. <laughs> We'd call it a luxury. Right, you shall have your wine. And one book, apart from the Bible and Shakespeare, which are already there, and we put the bar up on multi-volume encyclopedias. Well, I think I would like a book that taught me or told me how to grow uh, flowers and vegetables on a desert island. <laughs> right, we'll organise something. And thank you, Moira Limpany, for letting us hear your Desert Island disc. Thank you for having me. Goodbye, everyone. You've been listening to a podcast from the Desert Island Discs Archive. For more podcasts, please visit bbc.co.uk slash radio4. Thank you.